Hello, beautiful people. In this video, I'm going to review 20-ish mistakes students in US history, APUSH, and most folks make about American history. For you APUSH students, these are things you're gonna to wanna to avoid saying on any APUSH exam, because if you do, your teacher and America will cry. The first one is the most essential thing you should remember about the study of history, and it's this. People make lots of absolute statements and rarely recognize nuance in history. Avoid absolute statements in history. Everyone wanted freedom. Everyone violated prohibition. The North hated slavery. Everybody was poor. Nobody likes season eight of Game of Thrones. No blanket statements or overgeneralizations. Leave that to dumb politicians. There are absolutely no absolutes in history. Here's the first one. Students like to say that Native Americans are this monolithic group. The truth is indigenous people are a very diverse mix of people. They adapted to a variety of environments. They had different social structures. Some formed alliances with European powers. Many got screwed over, but there is no one Native American experience. Another mistake is confusing the Chesapeake and the New England regions. The truth is the 13 colonies were quite diverse. Different people came for different motives to different environments. So the Chesapeake is not where the pilgrims partied it up on Thanksgiving, praying and all that stuff. And New England is not where Pocahontas was sliding into some dude named John's DMs. So know the difference between these two regions. Bacon's rebellion led to slavery. The truth is Bacon's rebellion accelerated the transition of indentured servants to African slavery as a labor source, but slavery was established in the colonies in 1619. It is important you know about Bacon's Rebellion, but don't get it twisted and oversimplify things. Yes, it led to the growth of the institution of slavery, but sadly, slavery was a fact of colonial life well before Bacon's Rebellion. The French and Indian War was between the French and Native Americans. Here's the truth. The war was the French and their Native American allies versus the British, the colonists kind of, who were reluctant to fight, and very few of their native allies. So remember, during this war, the French had most of the natives on their side. Right after the French and Indian War, many colonists wanted independence from England. That is false. Truth, there was a slow movement towards independence between the years 1763 and 1776. Everybody hears the French and Indian War and thinks taxes, independence, but history is not that simple. Yes, taxes followed the war, and the relationship between Mama and the colonies became strained, but it took a lot of things to happen. You can see them right there to get us to the American Revolution. I mean, shots in 1775 were fired at Lexington and Concord, and they were still trying to work things out. Another mistake, the American Revolution was fought primarily over taxes. The truth is colonists were inspired by enlightenment ideals, desire for self-government, and resistance to new British imperial efforts. Yes, very few people like taxes, and some colonists dumped tea in a harbor, and colonists had some dope bars like no taxation without representation, but ideas of natural rights, wanting more autonomy and self-government, and resistance to the British ending solitary neglect and imposing taxes and enforcing existing laws all played a role. It's not just taxes. I've seen a ton of people say everyone in the colonies wanted independence from England. Here's the truth. Colonial society was divided between loyalists, patriots, and those who did not give up. You know what? You know, it feels good to say everyone was eating hot dogs, lighting off fireworks for freedom after the Declaration of Independence, but the reality is way more complicated. Mistake often made, the Articles of Confederation was a total failure. The truth, Articles did govern the nation during the American Revolution and created the Northwest Ordinances. Look, I'm typically a Debbie Downer type of guy, Mr. Negative, but we need to give credit to the AOC. Yes, it couldn't tax, was hella weak, but it did do some good stuff. The three-fifths compromise gave slaves three-fifths of a vote or was a good thing for black people. The truth, the three-fifths compromise dealt with how slaves would be counted for representation in Congress in the House of Representatives. Now, anytime you are talking about humans in terms of fraction, it's, it's probably not a good thing, but I've seen so many students say that three-fifths gave African-Americans three-fifths rights. Nope, nope, nope. Basically, the South wanted their slaves to count, not because they wanted to extend rights to them, but because the more people you have, the more reps you get. So at the Constitutional Convention, we compromised our values and said, let's count each slave as three-fifths humans so both the North and the South can be content with this new Constitution. The Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists were political parties. Nope. The first two-party system is Federalists versus the Democratic Republicans in the 1790s. The Anti-Federalists and the Federalists represent the two sides of the debate over ratification. Federalists were on team, yay, Constitution, and the Anti-Federalists were like, nah, no ratification to the Constitution. So the first two-party system is not until the 1790s when debates over Hamilton's plan and other issues led to the rise of political parties. And yes, one of them is the Federalists, and yes, many Anti-Federalists will be Democratic Republicans, but the Anti-Federalists were not a political party. 
I don't know how many times I've seen students go, what the hell is the antebellum period? All it is is the period used to describe the period before the Civil War. Students always get confused about this. So basically it's the time period, roughly 1820s. It has no official start date up until the Civil War. A lot of students don't know about the second two-party system. This is basically the Whigs versus the Democrat, and you best know about it. This is the whole Whigs versus Democrats, and basically the Whigs are beefing with Andrew Jackson over the bank and a whole bunch of other issues. So first two-party system, Federalists versus Democratic Republicans. This is the second two-party system in the 1830s, 40s. I've seen my fair share of students say the Mexican-American War is the same thing as the Spanish-American War. The truth is, the Mexican-American War took place from 1846 to 1848. The Spanish-American War took place in 1898. And if you think they're the same, you might be racist or hopefully just confused. Spain and Mexico are different places. The Mexican-American War is where we took half of Mexico's territory and opened up questions regarding slavery in those territories once again. And the Spanish-American War is when we took a bunch of Spain's colonies and it led to debates about the role of America in the world. They're different. This next one is a tough one. It's not sexualism increased and the South succeeded. It is sectionalism increased and the South seceded. There's a difference. This is probably the most popular one. The North was against slavery. The truth is, even on the eve of the Civil War, abolition was not a majority movement in the North. It would be nice if things were so simple, North free, South slave, but they are not. Yes, many Northerners in the 1840s and 50s came to oppose the extension of slavery in the territories. Many did not like the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, but the actual abolition of slavery was not very popular. With that being said, that's why these peeps are even more badass because of what they did and struggled against. This one's another popular mistake. The Emancipation Proclamation freed all the slaves and Lincoln was an abolitionist. The truth is Lincoln's main goal was preserving the Union and the Emancipation Proclamation was passed as a war measure and only freed slaves in territory that was in rebellion. This is another thing that is overly simplified and I can go into great detail about it because you know what would what did Lincoln really believe personally versus politically but the basics are this no Lincoln was not trying to end slavery everywhere when he was elected in 1860 it was a free soil position and the EP only applied to the Confederacy because Lincoln didn't want to piss off the border states that also had slaves but were still loyal to the Union the Seneca Falls Convention immediately led to the 19th Amendment Here's the truth, 1848 and 1920 are different years. Yes, at Seneca Falls, a group of women and a few men demanded suffrage and other things, and this is often seen as the start of the women's suffrage movement, but this convention happened in 1848, and a lot of stuff happened, both setbacks and steps towards getting to the 19th Amendment. Women got passed over for the vote when the 15th Amendment was adopted. Women played a big role in the many progressive reforms, the impacts of World War I, yada, 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 yada. So don't make this huge leap in your thinking, skipping historical developments. History is often a struggle, and so results are oftentimes not immediate. Speaking of suffrage, a lot of students like to say the women's suffrage movement fought for the rights of all women. The truth is more complicated. The women's suffrage movement disagreed on tactics and whether African-American women or women of color in general should be included in suffrage. It would be dope if the movement for suffrage was fighting for all women, but sadly, this is not how it went down. Women's suffrage movement is a broad turn spanning many decades and there were disagreements not only about tactics should we go for a constitutional amendment shout out alice paul or go state by state carrie chapman cat but also many women openly reject it including african-american women in the right to vote that's why when ida wells barnett started marching it was a big deal over there on the right the 15th amendment guaranteed the right of african-american men to vote Here's the truth. Following the end of Reconstruction, Southern states adopted literacy tests, poll taxes, property requirements, grandfather clauses, and outright violence to disenfranchise black voters. We all know the fairy tale version after the Civil War. Slaves were free. The 13th, 14th Amendment made everything wonderful, provided a bunch of rights. And yes, 15th Amendment did guarantee the right to vote regardless of race, but an amendment is only as good as its enforcement and the desire to uphold it. And after Reconstruction was abandoned, so were voting rights for most African-American individuals in the South. That's going to do it for this video. Hopefully this clears up a few misunderstandings you may have and prevents you from making them on your exam. Remember the key to success in history and A push is thinking critically and we have all sorts of videos to review the American experience on our website, apushexplained.com. If this video helped you out, click like, leave a comment, tell all your friends about the A push and AP government resources, which are free and have a beautiful day. Peace.